Bristol Legal, a show dedicated to bringing you legal issues that are relevant to Bristol County residents and beyond. Uh, I am Elizabeth Nowakowski. I'm the Associate Professor and Coordinator for Paralegal Studies at Bristol Community College. And today I'd like to welcome our guest, District Attorney for Bristol County, Thomas uh, Quinn III. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me, Elizabeth. And um, why don't we get started to, to, uh, to have a, dis let's have a discussion about the District Attorney's Office. I think many, um, many of our uh, viewers watch Law and & Order and other shows and they have an image of what District Attorney Office does and what the prosec prosecutors do. But if you could maybe clear up from your perspective and explain uh, what the office does and also maybe talk about some of the initiatives beyond what people perceive it to be that you have. Well, we the district attorney's office is in charge of prosecuting all criminal offenses in Bristol County, uh, approximately 20 cities and towns. Uh, most cases are prosecuted in the district courts. There's a district court in Fall River, there's a district court in New Bedford, there's a district court in Taunton, and one in Attleboro. The more serious cases ultimately are prosecuted in the Superior Court, which is now uh, in Fall River, the Fall River Justice Center. Those cases would include murder and rape and drug trafficking and serious assaults uh, and some other cases. Uh, our goal is to fairly and justly prosecute the cases uh, that come before us. Some are minor, some are in the middle of the road, and some are very serious. So we have a team of dedicated prosecutors in the four district courts and superior court who prosecute uh, these criminal cases. We have some specialties uh, that would include uh, domestic violence, financial fraud, uh, and homicides, uh, and uh, all the cases that, you know, we pro you know, there's many other cases that we prosecute, but we, we, we have certain people assigned to uh, those areas. And um, there's only one superior court in uh, Bristol County yes. at, at this point. For and criminal business. For criminal business. That's and, Fall River. Yes. And how many prosecutors do you have in your office currently? We have approximately 65 to 70. Uh, we'll be hiring some uh, several prosecutors uh, late next month when the bar results come out. Uh, so the staff has grown quite a bit since when I first started almost 30 years ago. And uh, how do you decide which cases go to trial, how, which one uh, to take to trial, and which one to actually prosecute? Uh, how, who makes the decision? And how? Well, the prosecutors make the decision, whether they're supervisors uh, in the district and superior courts. I mean, the district court has many more cases. Um, so an assessment is made of the facts, and, and uh, can we resolve it without a trial, which in fact is what happens to most cases. Uh, the Superior Court uh, is the same approach. It's a slower process, there's fewer cases, but they're much more time consuming uh, and the potential penalties are much greater. So, number one, the person, uh, the defendant represented by his attorney has to uh, have an interest in resolving it. Uh, we have to have an in interest in resolving it on their terms or terms that we can mutually agree upon or a judge in, in some cases can impose a sentence that they feel appropriate uh, which might be, which would be less than ours and maybe more than the def uh, defense recommendation uh, in a number of cases. So we can agree, which happens in many cases, a judge can make the decision on his or her own unless it's a mandatory sentence. Uh, and you try to achieve a fair and just result. Uh, that can be debatable at times, but it depends on the person's record, the nature of the crime, the evidence supporting the crime, uh, the person's potential for rehabilitation, or how badly someone was hurt in a particular case. And um, most cases do not go to trial, right? They do not make it to trial. That's correct. Uh, the uh, I think cases go to trial that can't be resolved. I mean, the system can't could not handle doing trials in the majority of the cases. But uh, generally speaking, there's a, a resolution of most of the cases and the ones that can't be resolved for whatever reason, which essentially is a person feels they didn't commit the crime or it can't be proven or the sentence recommended is is not to their liking. So that's why trying to, uh, people refer to it as plea bargaining. Uh, that goes on in most of the cases and is a very necessary part of the criminal justice process as long as it's not abused. 
And what about some other initiatives other than the actual um, trying cases that your office is involved in? Uh, involved in? Um, there are some preventive um, uh, projects and initiatives that you're working on. I know you're very much involved in the community. Can you speak to some of the top, um, top things on your list um, in that arena? Yes. I, I think the top of the list is trying to protect the public from serious, violent, repeat offenders. Those are the people who uh, have a history of committing crimes or committing very serious crimes with weapons or hurting children. Uh, that's a priority from the outset, if appropriate, to try to hold them in custody uh, until their case is resolved because we feel they're a danger to the community. That issue is becoming more and more important. Uh, I think there's some skepticism with people that uh, individuals get out of custody who shouldn't prior to the resolution of their cases, and that's something I feel very strongly about and will continue to push for. Uh, we, we also have um, financial uh, exploitation of elders that I have uh, 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 made a priority. Uh, unfortunately, it is rampant in our society. The attempts to do it, the successful attempts, our elders are a vulnerable group. Many uh, uh, widow or widowers and can be taken advantage of, unfortunately, by family members, caretakers, people that trust them. So I have created a financial crimes unit uh, headed by uh, Mike Scott, who's a prosecutor. I've added resources to it. We've brought charges in a number of cases uh, uh, because it just can't stand to uh, steal from the elderly, or anybody for that matter, but the elderly who are vulnerable through scams or uh, abuse of trust is just not acceptable. Uh, domestic violence is a big issue to me. Uh, I've never cared for somebody uh, abusing a woman. Uh, I think it's a cowardly act. Uh, it has grave implications for the generally women, it's women in 99% of the cases, and children who witness it, grow up with it, and unfortunately succumb to the example it's set and, and continue that cycle. We have designated people uh, working in that area, and we made great strides in holding especially violent repeat offenders accountable so that the woman can move on with her life, get some stability, and hopefully get past this cycle of abuse. Uh, from a uh, prevention point of view, being in the community is very important. We have a community affairs uh, unit that goes out in a number of areas. Uh, Financial is one. I've gone to every council on aging more than once in the, in the county to spread the message about elder fraud and abuse. Um, we have all uh, the, uh, in, we've also become involved in programs for uh, vulnerable youth, at risk youth, uh, such as a youth court in New Bedford and other things, because I think not everybody has uh, the best uh, of circumstances when they grow up. Uh, I believe that everybody, there's hope for everyone until they show that they're beyond hope and they're generally violent, repetitive behavior. So I've invested time and effort into trying to connect with some at-risk youth through uh, assisting financially in programs, speaking uh, throughout the county. Uh, that's important to me to, uh, to try to uh, reach them and show that everybody has, is worthwhile, everybody has value, try to move beyond your current circumstances. Um, going back to the elderly ab um, uh, issues, elderly abuse issues, um, have you seen a lot of crimes? That, do you see a lot of prosecutions in this area? And what um, have you seen? One of the things that is happening, a lot of elderly are getting online, so which is a great thing because they're exposed to more things and they can be in touch with their families and, and be more aware of what's happening. I think it creates its own risk and, uh, when you have elderly online who may not be as aware that they should not be clicking on and opening links and, and responding to certain emails that make, uh, may, do you see any of that uh, at all or not as much as some of the uh, other issues you've mentioned where? Yes, we see it. I mean, I think it's the phone, answering the phone and getting sucked into some of these scams. Okay. The computer also, so I agree with you. Uh, uh, my advice is very simply, simply and sadly, someone calling you on the phone, you don't know them, it's not in your best interest to answer the phone. They're trying to scam me, they're trying to scam members of my staff, mm -hmm. but people can get sucked in to these scams, the IRS threat of mm -hmm. prosecution, which is fake, mm -hmm. saying that your grandchild is in custody, you must send money right away, fake, but it jars people, just say no to it. That's my, the uh, my theme, the there's a computer scam where someone says your computer is broken, well, how would they know it's broken? Uh, but once you provide financial information, you get sucked in, you're out, you're out mm -hmm. money. And these 
scams would not be attempted if they were not successful. So I'm trying to advocate and educate uh, our elder folks and everyone not to fall for it. Don't be afraid to hang the phone up. Don't go online. If someone is calling you, you have caller ID. You know who the number is. You know who your daughter or son. I mean, answer the phone if it's the doctor. Don't answer the phone if they're calling from Arizona. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the, the most important thing is to keep talking to elderly, yes. whoever you are out there, <laughs> and educate them. Absolutely, because we've brought prosecutions in a number of cases. It's not a, uh, I think it's an issue that a lot of people uh, are offended by, but it's not easy to prosecute these mm. cases. If it's a family member, getting the elder to go against the family member, uh, or a caretaker, uh, it's a little easier there because you're not dealing with blood. No. but. That simply can't stand mm -hmm. to ruin someone's life when they should be enjoying it as best they yes. can under their circumstances mm -hmm. with health, you know, the various health uh, issues that pop up. It's just not acceptable to me. So I'm making the effort uh, to do it. I mean, it involves getting bank records. It involves the type of prosecution is a little more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're committed to doing it. I think we've had very good results uh, so far in the last two years. So it's important that if you see something, say something in those situations, because sometimes you may be suspecting that something is happening uh, with your neighbor or uh, elderly neighbor, so you should bring it up to someone's attention uh, and make someone aware. Uh, you maybe. should, because even if we prosecute the case, in the end, you're really not going to get satisfaction. I mean, we had a case recently in New Bedford. Uh, older gentleman was saving money uh, for his own well-being and his grandson's education, and an individual um, who he knew he trusted, had control of his financial affairs, stole $100,000. The man died and was left with the nursing home bill. Uh, we indicted the case. He did not go to jail, which was unfortunate because he should have been in, uh, in jail for what he did to that man. And those are, that's a, 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 a somewhat of an extreme example, but it is, mm -hmm. it is common that vari the variations of that type of conduct goes on, and it is despicable. And it's very sad because we all know that these things are happening and often are not caught. So many go unnoticed, um, and unfortunately, if someone doesn't, is not impacted immediately. A very good point. Uh, Most of it is not yeah. uh, going to be brought to our yeah. attention. Uh, but uh, to think that, uh, you know, someone's going to steal money, and they're never going to pay it back. Yeah. I mean, in most cases, they're not going to pay it back. They spent it gambling or whatever they did. But they've helped ruin or significantly impair someone's life, yeah. who in many cases so trusted and loved them. Yeah. Um, moving on to uh, domestic violence for a second, um, your office create, uh, has some resources as well for victims of domestic violence. Uh, I think you know, we know that one of the factors in domestic violence situations is fear and embarrassment. Um, and, in s and we have a lot of smaller communities in our county, and I wonder if um, some of the uh, victims put, uh, may be afraid to or embarrassed to go to the local police. Uh, to, to report, um, you know, the, 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 the situation. Uh, where should they be going to? What, what are some other options other than the local police department? Sometimes they may not have transportation. Where should, who should they call and can they contact your office, for example? They can. I mean, the best approach of someone I is being uh, the victim of domestic violence is to go to the authorities, okay. the police, because okay. that's a criminal matter. If you feel more comfortable initially going to a local program, there are program uh, 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 in various communities. Uh, in Attleboro, New Bedford, you have the Women's Center in different places. That's fine. But ultimately, um, that's a criminal matter. And they're difficult cases because, again, the woman who is the victim in most cases um, has a connection to the individual, the defendant, which I understand, and I have sympathy for the women in these cases. Uh, they love them. They, they're being supported by them. They have children together. Someone has shown affection and attention to them. That's the human component. And then they're intimidated after the charge is brought, told to not go forward, to lie to the court. Uh, so there's significant obstacles to prosecuting, but my feeling is I'm here to help protect the victims, which are the women and children in these cases, and even though they may not realize it and, and obstruct it somewhat, while I sympathize with them, we're going forward because it is in their best interest to be have this individual out of their lives who is hurting them and their children. They deserve better, 
And that's what we're trying to do. It's case by case. It's not drama where one case is going to make a difference. We've had several women come forward in these cases who have said, with him out of my life, I've moved forward, I feel better, and I'm moving in a new direction. And that gives me a lot of satisfaction because it's, you know, it's no pun intended. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat trying to prosecute mm -hmm. these cases because of these obstacles. But I'm committed to it. We have dedicated resources. Uh, putting your hands on a woman, especially some of the outrageous, violent conduct that I see, not acceptable. And you have a special group of prosecutors that deal with just those cases, is that right? That's correct. Uh, we have uh, uh, Prosecutor Courtney Cahill, who uh, has significant experience overseeing the, the domestic violence unit. We have education and prevention through the office, and in, in each court we have uh, victim witness advocates and prosecutors who handle those cases. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, let's talk about the office generally. Um, how has it changed over the years? You've been, a, you've been with the district attorney's office for many years. You've been in your current position for uh, a few years, but you were uh, in the top leadership mo role for almost a decade before that. Uh, how, has the, how have the trends changed? What, you know, the world is changing, the way we communicate is changing. Um, obviously, the laws are changing. <laughs> Uh, what do you, if you step back, what, what do you, you know, what are your thoughts? Well, I started almost 30 years ago, so I started out as a soldier, so to speak. So I, I sort of started from the bottom, if you will. Um, and then I, I worked for eight and a half years, and I was on my own for 10 years, and then I was the first assistant for about eight years, and now the DA for over two and a half years. So I've kind of been exposed to every aspect almost of the office, or at least in terms of positions. A sit, you know, young in the district court, in the superior court, first assistant. I think several things have changed. The, the violence related to drugs and guns has gone up significantly. In the early 90s, I'd say mid 90s, you did not see a lot of gun cases, pr most likely associated with, with drugs. Uh, in the Superior Court, there's a lot of them now. Uh, drugs existed back then, and there was a lot of it, but the groups that associated to protect their drug dealing operation has increased in more homicides specifically related to drug dealing. Uh, the technology has made a huge difference. Uh, DNA uh, has come into the forefront uh, since I was there before it was a blood comparison initially. We have DNA, we have uh, cell phones which are significant to solving many crimes now. Uh, we have uh, the phone numbers that connect individuals, we have text messages, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook and the technology has changed the uh, investigative landscape significantly. Um, a number of cases, the uh, Aaron Hernandez case, which is a big case, the Michelle Carter case, really a good part of it came down to technology, videotape surveillance uh, that was uh, often to evidence uh, that made a huge impact in the case. Um, that's what I see. Uh, domestic violence has always been there. Years ago, they didn't charge it as much. People didn't mm -hmm. come forward. But it's, uh, there's a lot of violent episodes of that. Uh, Elder fraud has always been there, I'm sure, but uh, it's become more, I think it's come out uh, in the open a little bit more. Uh, people have always been stealing. It's sad, it's, yeah, you know, uh, in, from a criminal sense, it's the American pastime, not to, uh, to use that analogy, but it is. Um, and, uh, but, uh, so I think those are the, the, some of the main things that I've, that, that I've seen is the technology, the increased violence. We've had uh, homicides, uh, I would say, going back 20 years, 25 years. You've always had them, but they're more specific to this sort of drug dealing and groups associated with it uh, that carry weapons now, uh, guns. And when you have a weapon, more inclined to use it. Uh, in especially if there's a confrontation or, or, or some type of violent interaction. Thank you. Uh, is there anything being done with the guns? Any projects, any initiatives to try to? I know some towns are looking into, you know, bring your own, you bring the, you know, sort of voluntarily bringing the the guns into police stations. And uh, is there anything like this planned for for, uh, for the? Count? I believe so. Uh, I think that's. A, a, a appropriate and effective tool, but the, the problem is there's so many guns in our society mm -hmm. all over the place. Uh, that's important. It's a psychological impact, but individuals, uh, non-law-abiding citizens who don't have licenses and permits are running around these communities, particularly the cities, mm -hmm. with loaded guns. 
dealing drugs for protection, and it's caused uh, a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. and, I, and not that that didn't exist before, but it's increased significantly yeah, from what I've yeah. seen the last 20 years. Thank you. Uh, what about budget? Let's just mention the budget. I know that we all know that the state and many cities and towns are struggling with the budget um, deficits. Uh, has that impacted your office at all? And, and, and if yes, how? I mean, I know you're working with probably other nonprofits. Um, um, does it impact your, your office, the way you do your job and the initiatives that you are responsible for? It can. Uh, when I first got appointed, it was in the midget, middle of the budget cycle two years ago, so I think we're approaching two years in the budgets. I mean, the money that's appropriated uh, is always an issue because we uh, have a very, we are very busy and it's, it can be resource driven, the type of things you want to get involved in. We, our main responsibility is to prosecute the crimes coming in, but having programs and more staff uh, can be critical. Uh, my feeling is, I mean, I've worked with the legislature. The, I, I think I've developed a good relationship with them. They've been helpful uh, to me. We were able to increase our state police overtime funding. Uh, there's a state police unit assigned to our office that in primarily investigates homicides, uh, but they are incredibly busy with the increase of drug, fatal drug overdoses and, uh, so, you know, the violent uh, homicides that occur. So I was happy to get that with their help. Um, we've been level funded, but I am trying to run an efficient office uh, uh, and not be uh, corralled by the budget unless there's a crisis because I need to keep moving mm -hmm. forward. So um, we've been level funded basically the last year or two, but there's a lot of competing interests. I think uh, the legislature has been good to us. I hope that will continue, but I appreciate their concerns. We're just a not a drop in the bucket, but there's many c competing concerns. So I've tried to manage the budget effectively. I think at this point we're in good shape going forward. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what about uh, rehabilitation services? Is your office involved in that at all? Or n not as much? Not, not really. Yeah. I mean, that's not, uh, that's not in our uh, area, if you will. Mm -hmm, I yeah. mean, we're in charge of prosecution. We certainly take into account during the resolution of cases someone's uh, potential for rehabilitation. Um, if they have a drug problem that we think could be manageable, if they have a history and are engaging in uh, conduct uh, that puts them in a more positive light for rehabilitation that might impact the sentence. But um, those are generally outside agencies, probation department supervises it. Okay. If someone is on parole, mm -hmm. uh, they would supervise that. Okay. Uh, I have one question that I received from one of our students who wanted to find out what your thoughts are on civil forfeiture, which it has been um, a little controversial as we are uh, we are one of the states that had sort of the lowest bar uh, and I was wondering if you could maybe just mention to the audience what it is and your thoughts on it. Well, uh, the civil for forfeiture from our perspective basically re involves uh, seizing uh, financial proceeds from drug dealing activity. So in our case, it's not like 90, almost 100% money. So someone is arrested in, in a drug case. It has to be related to selling. Uh, it's routine that money seized during the arrest would be uh, taken into custody mm -hmm. and potentially forfeited. Uh, drug dealers should not profit from their drug dealing. Uh, that money should be, should be taken from them. Uh, it's not uh, a just, uh, it's almost an unjust enrichment by uh, essentially preying on people who are overdosing, in some cases fatally. Uh, but there has to be a process of protection. It's a civil process. Uh, most of our cases, uh, if there's a criminal resolution in a drug case, this is drug dealing I'm talking mm -hmm. about, not possession. Mm -hmm. You cannot seize money if it's just a, a, a okay. person possessing the item, uh, possessing drugs and has some money. It's got to be tied to uh, drug it's dealing. Be um, the money is forfeited by agreement. Some of it's not a lot, some of it's a lot. Uh, there is another procedure where you could just, even if there's not an arrest, move into court and attempt to forfeit it. So uh, I support it as long as it's not abused. I don't abuse it. I've returned money to people that we felt was not properly subject of forfeiture because it was not related to drug dealing. Uh, I, I've uh, spent a lot of time in our forfeiture work and I think have developed an appropriate balance. Uh, no reasonable person is going to agree that somebody who's making money uh, 
uh, off heroin and S pills yeah, should. should keep that money. But there has to be a process, there is, I abide by it, and the money should be seized and put to appropriate use. But can the police uh, seize the car that that, that the deal was going they on can. in? Uh, what we, if it was the family member's car, it wasn't the person's car? Well, let me just say this. I have pretty tight uh, uh, procedures on whether we're going to attempt to forfeit a car. Okay. We don't forfeit many cars. Okay. Um, the classic forfeiture of a car, in my opinion, would be you have bought a uh, Lexus with your drug dealing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's not a legitimate transaction. We don't see that much. We, some cars are seized and forfeited. Most of them don't have much value, frankly, in the end. They, they were 2003 something, uh, 2005. So we do that sparingly. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, abusive in the forfeiture process and have not been. And as I said, I, I can tell you personally, before I became the DA, I was involved in hundreds of those cases and personally talked to some people and gave money back uh, uh, to people. Uh, so uh, cars, not many uh, are forfeited. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Can you mention, um, maybe say a few words about Corey's uh, and your thoughts on it and you know how they impact people's lives and you know your office is obviously limited in what you can do but your just your thoughts on the, the process and and how it impacts some people who have done something in the past something that they probably regret now uh, I feel very strongly that if someone has made a mistake in their life uh, in their life uh, going back a number of years uh, that that should not be held against them if they move forward now again I'm not, I don't see the vast majority of, uh, of, of those cases. Uh, I'm, a, as I said, a believer in redemption where appropriate, but if somebody had a matter when they were 20 years old and they've moved forward and that's going to hurt them in their life, I am opposed to that. I, object, I strongly uh, uh, don't like it, let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. now, what I, it's not in my area, but um, certainly I've had a number of cases over the years uh, that have been brought to my attention that have neg would have a negative impact on an individual who has moved forward with their life, and I've participated in a resolving that case so that would not be a burden. So uh, I don't think we should have stringent quarry laws that can hurt uh, uh, an individual uh, from their past. We all make mistakes. I mean, we're not talking about individuals, you know, raping children or stealing vast amounts of money. That should be part of the record because people want to know about that and could have liability if someone was brought in. But in general, for minor matters, or someone made a mistake, I am sympathetic that people should be allowed to move forward. Okay. I think we are out of time, so I wanted to thank you again for joining us today, uh, and hopefully we'll see you back on the show in a couple of months so you can give us more updates on, on your initiatives and what is happening in our county. I'd be happy to come back. Thank you for having thank you, me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and look out for new episodes of Bristol Legal. Thank you. Thank you.